All right, everybody. Thank you to our sponsors, of course, at Skypoint Cloud and Lexicon Solutions. Uh, without further ado, I hope you'll all join me in welcoming uh, Mr. Reed Havens onto the screen. Um, what I want to talk about today is kind of some of the, the common um, patterns and practices that I've seen people putting in uh, in reports and kind of ways to identify some of those. So in a, in a way, this is kind of a mixture of things to avoid, uh, things to implement, and also like some of the common things that I look for uh, when someone's given me a report to improve or to, to fix up or clean up in general. And as I'm sure many of us have experienced with being handed off files or reports or anything else, there's often little to no documentation that comes with it or the person's busy or they've left the company. So, you know, what do you do to put on your detective hat and uh, whip out the magnifying glass and kind of do the review yourself um, along those regards? So that's kind of what I want to go through today. And a little uh, background about myself. Um, so I've been in the BI space now for about 11 years. I started all the way back with like PowerView and Power Pivot way back in the day in the Excel environments. Um, naturally progressed my way up using Power BI Designer, Power BI today, and um, started leaning kind of more and more heavily onto uh, report design and aesthetics, um, hence the, the nickname, the VizWiz, uh, Visualization Wizard, uh, and where my avatar was kind of born from as well uh, for my brand. Um, and so the thumbnail that you see most of my YouTube videos that I have, I think this is my, uh, Greg, third time, third or fourth time presenting at the Portland user group. Yeah, and in person. We had our in-person at Lucky Lab with you, which was sweet. I mean, you're just yep. a yearly presence, which has been, you know, uh, lucky for us and so appreciate you for, you know, making that regular commitment with us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, happy to be back on. So, um, yeah, I'm a uh, you know, Northwest native. I'm up here in Seattle, Washington, so not too far of, of a stretch from where everyone is for, for sure. Uh, thanks for the link, Tina. But um, yeah, that's a little bit about myself, um, and I'll, I'll have a bunch of links later on. Um, I did try to do the, the the live present from PowerPoint. It didn't let me do that into this tenant, but I will have, uh, thank you, yeah, links to drop by later for some of the other stuff at the end of the day that we can put into the chat. Uh, here. So what I like to do with this talk as well as any others is I do like to kind of make these discussions, presentations, very scalable. So I can I can do this in 30 minutes. You give me two and a half to three hours, I can do it as well. So we'll get through a lot of these conversations uh, because I prefer visualization and design. I kind of like to start from the reader and the reading view. So that's the experience you have in the Power BI service. So we'll kind of start a conversation around there on, on what things can you do to shore up and improve a report, that, that little extra polish um, as well with visualizations, design, uh, bookmark inspections. Uh, a lot of the stuff that's really in the report layer and then kind of moving into the modeling and other stuff as well that I look for as um, some of those things, uh, pitfalls to avoid practices uh, to implement um, that can help improve all of those. So we'll get through a bit of those. I'll kind of mix, mix and match to keep this uh, fun and interactive. I encourage you to ask questions along the way. Um, feel free to drop yeah, comments in there uh, in, in the chat. I do have that open on my window um, over on the left of my widescreen. So um, I can track those as I go through this stuff and I'll, I'll answer along the way as you have questions or curiosities. Um, but like I mentioned, what I want to start with is the report user experience, uh, crafting or curating the user experience. So a lot of that conversation goes into not only setting up the report with the right defaults, but also um, ensuring that the, the, the visuals, the page, everything else has been configured properly as well. Um, just because as you're building all of this stuff out, what you really want to um, make sure is that the report can be as streamlined and as simple as possible. Like the KISS methodology, keep it simple, stupid, is something that works in design, it works in web pages, it works for reporting, it works for data models, like the simpler, the better for most stuff. And um, we want to reduce the complexity and cognitive load that a person has when they're looking at a report page. So defaults are important to that as well. And a few listed here, just uh, slices, selections, pages, even sorting order, all that. But in conjunction though with this, what they see first is also paired together with what is something that can be configured as far as pop-ups or information that can show up for them. So that's not only what the visual headers can have, like what, what icons show up when you hover over a visual, um, what's accessible to them. The, you know, how, how useful could any of us argue that a um, focus mode is, is a useful uh, feature to be able to, to apply to a, um, to a slicer or to a shape in the background. So um, making sure that these are properly configured. And we'll see this during the demo, but I'm just starting with the conversation of all these things that uh, um, could be interacted with. But Microsoft is, 
to quote a movie, it likes to give you everything everywhere all at once. And it, while it's not wrong to do that, it is not optimized. It's too much, too many buttons, too many things to click, too many pop-ups that show up. And it causes a lot of noise as the person's exploring. It's distracting. Like imagine a, you know, a blinking light in the corner of your eye if you're trying to watch a movie. It's kind of hard to focus on something if you have something popping up over to your peripheral all the time. And I kind of think pop-ups uh, in a report page like that as well with all the little icons just scattered everywhere that keep showing up as you move your mouse. So we'll, we'll talk about ways to curate that as well. And another thing um, in conjunction with that, like part of the, the user experience, we have our defaults. We have what do we want to show or not as a conversation. <laughs> Excuse me. Another really important thing is the filters pane. It's something that I see that is not used um, as often as it could be. One, because it does require some considerations and thinking around exactly how we would want to, and, um, to use this and to make sure that it is not too complicated for the users, especially around report level filters, page level filters, and visual level filters. If you scope these out in terms of what the report consumers should use and what the developer should use, you have kind of two areas where visual level filters are almost always something that should be hidden and set by the developer like a top in or you're filtering out blank from a slicer but rarely if ever should a user select a visual and go apply a filter to that one visual on a page it's something that um, when you click a visual it pops up it can cause a lot of confusion and it's just it's noise you're looking at all these filters in the pane that could be uh, avoided so we'll, we'll walk through exactly how to configure and customize these um, there are some limitations today as well on some of these configurations I mentioned. Uh, currently, it, they are only available to observe these changes, like hiding a filter, making header configuration changes. All of those can only be observed in reader mode in Power BI service. Um, those things are on the roadmap and desktop where eventually we'll get like a preview reader mode in Power BI desktop where you can see what it will look like for the end user. It will basically um, mirror the published experience, which for as you can imagine, for a lot of us, will drastically reduce the amount of time of having to publish back and forth to make some of these changes. But it is sadly a uh, um, limitation today that just takes a lot of time to go through that. Now, continuing that conversation with like hiding filters and the filters pane, kind of looking into slicers as well and, and how these uh, pair with it is we have two options for the filter pane that are really important that most people do not apply that should be also something that is added or upgraded to reporting. Blocking and hiding are two attributes you can apply to any, um, any filter that is at the visual, the page, or the report level in the filters pane. Now, the effects of these, let's actually take a look here. So let's assume that I have a visual level filter for this chart that is applying top 10 by page views. Now, if it's neither locked or hidden, just applied, if I hover over the filter icon, I will see that filter showing up in this uh, filter list for the visual. Each visual has a little visual, um, has an icon in the visual header that shows you what um, unhidden applied filters are added to or being applied to that visual. Now, my argument for this is that, again, very useful feature, but I see as a common pitfall is you end up with lots of developer filters that are in here, a top 10 or something does not equal blank or all sorts of stuff that was built out to make the report page look a certain way and you know to, to create the aesthetic that you need, but nothing that the user would ever add, edit, or remove. Now, if they make a slicer selection for year equals 2017, and if they hover over this, and that one filter that they applied is mixed together with five or six developer filters, it's really hard for them to know what they've added, removed, or modified themselves as the report interaction experience. So ideally, what we'd want to do is have certain items like this where we would hide and lock the filters if it's something that would be applied to it. The title should probably imply what those filters should be, you know, top end. And then the, uh, the list of filters being applied to that visual is now cleared out and will start populating when, when the user starts interacting with the report page. So it keeps a very clean uh, perspective for the end user to know what they have or have not applied. When this is empty, they have not applied any filters on the page yet. As soon as they start seeing filters in there, they know they can go clear that slicer. They can change the filter in the filters pane. So my goal with building a curated report experience is to make sure that this is uh, does, uh, does not have any irrelevant or unnecessary filters showing up into here that the users cannot interact with or change. So those locked 
filters should typically be hidden. But that's one, uh, again, one of those features that is uh, great for the user when implemented correctly, but it's easy for it to get complicated and confusing if you just kind of publish as is without going through some of this curation experience. Um, and we'll see that um, application of fixing this up during the demo as well. Last little conversation just to mention, like the header icons, as you can see, a lot of options are available in there. The header icons per visual can be turned off uh, entirely. So you can turn off the entire visual header or you can turn off or on individual icons. A common one that I actually turn off uh, pretty regularly is the pin. Um, I'm sure if I asked for a raise of hands in the, the room, the number of people who still regular, regularly use dashboards, and I'm not talking about like a report dashboard, an actual dashboard in the Power BI service, most people probably don't anymore. They're essentially a dead product and a dead feature for Microsoft, but they still exist. The pin icon lets you pin to those, but you need that pin icon to show up on every single visual in the report when they're hovering over it if nobody is ever gonna make a dashboard. So there's many opportunities to think about what should be turned on or off. Um, Tina, if you can pl uh, plug a link um, for Mike Carlo's Power BI theme generator in the chat, that would be great. Uh, Mike Carlo recently, released a new theme generator because Microsoft um, opened up the, the documentation to every single attribute that can be configured in a theme file. And it actually has an option per visual for you can configure the default. So you can create your own custom theme and you can actually choose like for a slicer. I want every new slicer that's made in this report, this theme applied with the header icons turned off. Um, I want every visual to have pin turned off. So you can actually globally um, add into the theme file using the UI in his uh, a theme creator generator, and he will be on next Tuesday, actually, uh, in about five days. Yep, um, and he's going to demo exactly all the features in his theme generator. So check out my channel for that. Um, but I do love that instead of having to go through and do this manually, there's a tool that will help you to set the defaults for this. Um, it's a really, really cool uh, visualization. If you, just, if you just Google Power BI Tips theme generator, um, and hopefully we'll get the the link in there. Uh, I think. Oh, perfect. Yeah, here's the walkthrough. Um, it is a fantastic tool. And again, he as a little just bit of a tangent. Apparently he has the the thing that updates the engine. Um, it automatically scrapes like once a week, the documentation library that Microsoft has publicly posted in the browser. So as soon as they add something new to their theme documentation that can be altered, it automatically would add a menu option to configure that in his little UI that he has. So it like it auto updates to keep in sync with every single feature. And it takes the name, the title, the description. So everything you see into there is, is coming from the Microsoft documentation directly um, from GitHub, I believe. Um, but it's nice because he doesn't have to update it. It's just, it always stays in sync with every property. And there's a few hundred in there, but digressions aside, it's a great tool that is used in conjunction with uh, the conversation that I'm having here. Uh, and again, like I mentioned, reader mode is the only place you can observe these changes, though thankfully, Light at the end of the tunnel, pot at the end of the rainbow. We will have options to update these coming in the near future, which would be really, really nice. Um, but yeah, uh, um, check out the the link to my stream next week. And uh, one more request from you, Tina. If you actually do go to my YouTube channel, if you go to the live section, there should be a URL link to Mike's upcoming stream that's public there that you can uh, um, drop into here. And that basically will just be the same link that will go live on next Tuesday at 9 a.m. But We'll have a, like a one hour walkthrough of all the awesome stuff you can do with the theme generator. All right. Sounds good. I'll find that. Perfect. Yeah, it should be right at the top of the list. Um, the last thing that I'll mention as well as uh, kind of another hidden feature that I love for uh, visualizations is the help tooltip that's built into the visual header. So that was something that was added. Always feels like recently, but probably three years ago. Um, it basically builds in a little helper icon at the top and it allows you to type in a body of text that you can provide to give context for the visual. So whether or not that is um, helping you explain what the visual is telling you, <clears throat> maybe providing some context for the data contained within, but little explainer text boxes that can describe something for people who are less familiar with the report, the data, or the um, or the type of visual itself. Let's you know, maybe you're using a violin chart or something. So it's a nice little way to build in information to give context to the user. It's kind of buried. The fact that um, the help tooltip box here will not show up until you toggle this on. So you have to go to first to the visual header section, <clears throat> open up the icon section, turn on the help tooltip, and then finally you'll get a menu that type um, to put 
whatever help or text you want to in there. Um, I personally prefer if they had maybe just the toggle right next to the help tooltip section and keep the menu always open. It's a bit buried, but I've more than once given a, uh, avid feedback to um, Microsoft and like this is a buried feature and that's why I mentioned it. All right. Um, last thing that I think I'll talk about here. Oh yeah, that's the links for later. So with that said, this get this sets up the context and the narrative for what I wanted to talk about from a reporting perspective. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over now to there we go <clears throat> my Power BI report. So I'm using PowerBI.com specifically because again the these kind of things cannot be tested in reader mode. A couple of other little hints that are coming out. So from some other people who have already made external tools, and I won't say whom or when, I'll give the Microsoft answer soon. Um, there is eventually, I, be, I believe, a report best practices analyzer that, that somebody's building that will be coming out. So if any of you have used Tabular Editor, there is a best practices analyzer for the model. So it shows you um, you know, the, the types of relationships you have. It, like, there's a lot of like flags where you can go and clean up the model. Things for the report are also being built that will scan the report file. And what I'm about to show you as a manual process, hopefully at some point we'll get a tool where we put it at a PBIX file, point it at one or a report in the service, and it'll immediately give us a list of like, um, oh yeah, we noticed that you, you have a relationship turned off between these two visuals. You have a, a visual with three um, visual level filters unhidden that, uh, that are in the report, like all sorts of stuff that will automate a lot of this process. So like it's one of the most exciting things that I've been told as uh, from my, my colleague is building this. Uh, they're collecting things that they want to monitor and analyze first. But if that comes out, I will 1000% be doing a live stream because the process that I'm showing you now will be drastically shortened in terms of the ability to do this. Um, but I just want to mention that there's some cool stuff hopefully coming in maybe in the next six to 12 months. Uh, but the way today to test right now, just because we don't have those fancy tools, there is no tell me what's wrong with my report tool. It is a fine, you're combing your report with a fine toothed comb. The comb is your mouse. And what you're looking for is the icons, like what pops up, what is showing around. So the these are the things that I've mentioned is the little blinkers or the distractors that are in your report. You don't want to have a person coming into a report and finding all these little icons popping up everywhere. So it's something that does not uh, provide a clean user interface. For one, it breaks the continuity of blended elements together. I pretty much have uh, this discussion with most of the user groups that present this at. I'm OK adding one or two background objects to the page. Like there's a shape behind here to frame these. There's a shape up here at the top to frame those. It's two objects that are on the page. It's adding maybe 20 milliseconds to the report load time. It's essentially unmeasurable. Like nobody's going to notice. It's totally fine. Um, there are people who milk water from a rock and want the report to be as fast as humanly possible. So what they do is they create a background image with those shapes built in. They load it into the background. My problem is as soon as I want to move anything to the left or the right, I immediately have to go create another image every time. And I just hate making an image repeatedly and importing it into my file. It's just I've tried it and it bugs me. Um, so I prefer shapes. But if you use shapes, we don't want these little icons to show up like you can see right here under the page. So as I move my mouse around, these are these symbols and icons that A, should be turned off entirely, or B, we should consider which of these should still show or not. Great example of the one that we'll want to turn off is for the image in the background. So I'll start with those and for the, for the, the bookmark. So I'll also mention to you a pro tip of the quickest and easiest way to make these edits. So I could go back to Power BI Desktop. I can make the change. I save it, I publish it, I refresh this page. That is technically one way you could do this. It's a very slow process to do that. Imagine if this was a 250 megabyte file. All right, you're now waiting three to five minutes between each publish. If you miss something, you go back to your desktop, you try it again. The fastest route to home that I've found to make these types of changes in Power BI is to use the edit button in your workspace if you have permissions to do that. Let's go ahead and make some changes. So I'm going to that image. I want to turn off my header icons here. There we are. Uh, bookmark, same thing. Turn off the header icons. Background image, turn off the header icons. All three of those have been configured. I go back to reading view. I save my report page. So let's first look at the output. One, you can see that the continuity is nice and clean. Like I can click the buttons. Those are nice. But all those little pop-ups 
uh, gone. So now everything that's right here on the page is blending in a lot better with the actual um, the report so that there's a cohesion that's happening that just makes everything fit better when you don't have the pop-up showing up everywhere. At the end of the day, when I'm done making all of my changes that I'm gonna walk through, what you can do is you can go to file, you can go to save a copy, and what that will do, or sorry, not save a copy, um, download this file. This will download a, 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 um, a clean PBX file with the, if this is an import with your report and your data set, I believe you get a, a prompt to do either. You can download the whole thing, or you can do a thin report if you wanted to, your choice, but you get a copy of that, pop that back in a OneDrive or SharePoint or GitHub, Azure DevOps, wherever you've kept this, and it's not, it's not perfect. I wish you didn't have to like copy the file technically, but I found it to be consistent, reliable. I've never had an issue with the file having a problem doing this, but edit to reader mode, just back and forth like that. I can iterate so much faster than going back to desktop and the service over and over again. So my final polishes for this stuff is pretty much just done in here. And then I download the finalized copy when I'm done. So that's my recommendation. If you're trying to make these changes, you'll iterate a lot faster just editing it in the service. Um, we will eventually have options for this in Power BI desktop, but that's Q2 uh, this year, or um, no, Q, Q4, S, semester two, fourth quarter, sometime around there is so hopefully when we'll get the reader mode preview in Power BI desktop. So, so that's we, one, um, yes. We got a question from Ty, yeah, and this is really interesting. I really like your methodology here, you know, until mm. that update happens. Um, but Ty's wondering, you know, do you prefer working in Power BI service or the online versus the desktop at this point? Only for these specific changes. So if I am, if I am editing the visual header, cons or as well. In with layering, one other thing that's important is you want to make sure this doesn't happen. If the user clicks in the background, you want to make sure it doesn't pop forward, which is another toggle. Those three things: hidden filters in the filter pane visual header configurations, and this specific setting, all three of those have to be observed in reader mode. So that's the only time I ever use the Power BI service. I personally prefer desktop. They recently just added in preview um, uh, model edits. You can actually now do some model editing in the service. Like their, their long-term goal is near feature parity between desktop and, and web and, and be less and less reliant on it. There's still a long ways to go um, for that, but... Um, yeah, no, no links or anything yet um, for Kevin. But uh, overall, like that's the only time that I use the service. Not because I like it better. It's just there's no other way to do it easily for for these uh, three um, considerations. Uh, this type, I mean, I I do this for my report too. But these are the things that I look for. Like this is what I'm combing through. Like I will I will go through and I'm scrubbing through the report with my mouse to find stuff that the developer has left. Because sadly, there's nothing to tell me what bad practices have been implemented for a report. If I'm doing the model, which we'll talk about later, I have tabular editor, I just throw on the best practices analyzer, boom, I get a list of 85 items I can go work on. We don't today have anything like that for the report. And that's why I wanna start here first is, you wanna Google, you know, analyze best practices for a model, tools available for that. This does require a bit more of your thinking cap and investigation to go find this stuff. Um, yep. But the th the things that I would consider can be missed, um, continuing continue the visual header route. So like focus mode, I've had plenty of clients click something like this and like, uh, I screenshot, like I broke the report. Okay, so yeah, you full screen an object that obviously does not benefit from this feature. And you know if you don't know to click back to report, it looks like you kind of just cleared out everything onto the page. Um, so those are the things that, uh, we can also turn off individually. Like, let's assume maybe I might still want to um, to do something with this visual. Maybe I want to keep filters on this visual um, or anything else. If I wanted to con configure parts of the header to turn on or off, you have that flexibility as well. So the slicer here, I'm in a general. We're going to go to header icons. Like I said, this is how many clicks it takes to get to be the, the help tooltip if you wanted to turn it on. You have to go to general header, open up icons, Turn, up help, turn on help tooltip. It's a little, very buried section in there, but I want to turn off focus mode. Disable that there. And again, it's still there. You cannot observe it when you're in edit mode. And edit mode is the same as Power BI desktop. That is the only mode that you can work in in uh, Power BI desktop today. So we're going to go back to reading mode, and then we can see that at a level of here, 
that icon is gone. So there's a large degree of you want to make sure that anything that hovers that can be clicked or popped up is any of that necessary. And I would say most of these should be turned off for most visuals. There's You only want the ones on when it's relevant or applicable. Like you, I am guessing somebody does not need to share this slicer. You probably don't need to add a comment or export the data. Most of these other settings are completely unnecessary for that. And I'll show you where that option is in here just as one last conversation around the slicer. I'm gonna go back to header icons. Mm -hmm. While you look for that, Reed, um, mm -hmm. you know, just just to reiterate for the for the audience, you know, Raymond was saying this is, you know, this example that you're showing is really the the inherited report. It's not something you developed yourself. And so this idea around, hey, you've inherited a, rep a report. Here are some of like the base level things you should go through just for readability, sharing, and just having a clean report, right? If you're wanting to put a polish it on onto it, yes, like th these are the things to look for in in a report that can be. If it also can be yours, uh, yours too. I'll I'll can yeah. probably get ninety eight percent of these if I do it myself, um, versus ten percent that this person's done. Um, but this is a good audit process to do with any reports in general, but especially on one that's been given to you, just because there currently, sadly, is no tools that tells you what's right or wrong. So I'm going to give you three takeaway items that will really help to. Um, to get rid of a lot of the ugly baby parts of a report page. Um, and then we'll start getting into the modeling um, as well of, of items that I look for is, is kind of red flags um, from some stuff. And especially for people who consider themselves to be a good developer. If so, okay, yeah, this was built by a Power BI expert. Okay, I'm gonna, there's like three things that I'm gonna look for. And if I see these here, immediate signs that you're like, not necessarily, you're probably putting your skill uh, level much higher than it needs to be. Um, so it's the more options, yeah. Unfortunately, you cannot turn off the more options individually. So that ellipses here, these cannot be one at a time configured, but globally, you can just turn that off in, uh, entirely. And then that just gets rid. There we go. And it gets rid of that. So you can start to just whittle these away one by one. Um, last thing that I'll talk about as far as the visual headers before I move the conversation on to discussing the filters pane and curating that as well is the idea that Again, pop-ups, it's a setting that not everyone might be aware of, but if you do layer items, which again, I've already discussed the pros and cons of integrating this with your background versus a pop-up. If you have two or three containers to group things, not a problem, you're adding a few milliseconds. But if you do do that, you wanna make sure somebody doesn't click it and then get this weird little pop-up kind of glitch effect. So that's something where you'd wanna set under the properties, you have maintain layer order that was added three years ago. But with that on, what that does is it actually is uh, maintaining your selection pane order precedence. So in the selection pane, anything that is at the text box or like by text box right here, and this selection pane is another conversation that I'll have. Um, but what you really want to do is um, ensure that it's below whatever items you are, because it's going to be in the background, just like in PowerPoint, you know, top to bottom is front to back. So if you turn on maintain layer order, anything in front of it, it won't pop in front of. I turned it on, I still see the effect. Again, only, only observable in reading view. Go back to reading view. Now, if I click it, I'm still, I'm selected it. Technically I have actively selected that box in the background, but it's not showing up. So that's now maintaining the layer order in the, uh, in the selection pane and kind of behind the curtains. You don't need to do it for the items in the front, you could, nothing's gonna change as far as the behavior, but it's designed to be select background, prevent from popping up in the front. So that's the goal of the, uh, the maintain layer order is it allows you to maintain that effect. Now this is just opening up the selection pane, a good opportunity before I move to the filters pane to describe what I look for as some, some bad examples. So I, uh, this is inherited from my Excel days. Uh, if I open an Excel report from someone who really takes their time and supposedly does house cleanup and polishes everything. I look to see if their pivot tables have names. If they have pivot table 35, pivot table 72, if they've not get, given their tables and their pivot tables proper names, um, especially when you're, you're connecting slicers, same thing in Power BI. Have they given names to their items in their selection pane? Like I have a bunch of spark lines in here. Um, I would much prefer to see names and groups to organize this stuff. It's a lot harder to manage and to move when you have items organized like this versus Things that I recommend to everybody um, completely across the board is that if you're going to pull in items into here, that I would want to see groups for each of your sections and then subgroups below those to organize that. Like my title section 
is grouped together to organize all of the items up there. My heat map and all the items related to it are grouped into there. I have my slicers grouped as well into a single section. So not only does it let you show and hide them or utilize bookmarks more easily, but it goes a long way into, think of it like a folder structure. Instead of one folder with 85 files in it, I could have multiple subfolders to kind of find my way into the section of the report that I care about. Um, so they, they both benefit to just making visibility toggling with bookmarks easier, but it cleans that kind of a cleanup house thing um, where for the developer, it uh, makes it easier to find, move, copy and paste other pages, all sorts of benefits from that. And I think it's it's easily over missed, but I use that as a mark of a, of a good developer. Uh, whenever I've hired anybody for a project, um, I, I have a workbook similar to this um, that I basically throw at them with a ton of problems that I've added into it. And I basically just see how much of this can you identify, fix, clean up, optimize or improve. And I basically gave them, give them an ugly baby story of like, I, I just, I want this to be a smaller file. I want it to look better. I want it to be cleaned up and I want it to be organized. And I'm not going to tell you anything other than like, I'm a client who knows zero about Power BI. This was built by a developer who left the company and you just need to figure out what to do. And I want to see how much, many of the, the artificially added problems they can find. And that's one thing that I look at it almost and, um, initially is just, did you do anything with the selection pane at all when it comes to those? Like same thing with people who have hidden measures and all sorts of stuff once we get to the fields list. Um, there's lots of other junk that can be kept into the model or visuals that aren't used anywhere. So just speaking of kind of like a, a little bit of house cleanup. And like I said, I, I want to move around subjects just as they, they come up naturally. But if you can remove a visual, a lot of people don't think to use this. But if you remove a visual, you can see what visuals are used in your report. This Gantt chart, somebody added this at one point and they probably thought they wanted to use it. They got rid of a page that had it. They never deleted this. Now, each time you add a custom visual to the file, it adds file size as well. It has to download the PBI VIZ file. There, there's an actual file type for custom visuals. And Power BI desktop file is a zip file. It has your images, your pictures, um, your, your visuals, all the stuff gets added to it. And some of those visuals can be five or 10 megabytes, depending on what's gone into it. Like it's, They're not particularly optimized for storage. Um, so I've had many reports where I come in and I, I look at this, this visuals remove page. They have like 13 different custom visuals basically just shotgunned into their little sec section over here and they're using one or two of them. So you go through, delete all of them and uh, it will save you file size. And again, it's if you add something to the report, if you don't use it, make sure to take it away. And uh, one little just last tip on that conversation and then I, I'll come back from my tangent and go, go to the filter span. I do want to talk about the fact that uh, when I build a report, I start with absolutely nothing. Like every time I add a table or anything else to the model, I add only the exact columns I find in the requirements. This will make sure that you don't ever add stuff you don't need to. If you're connecting to a fact table in SQL, please, for the love of God, do not bring in 85 columns from that table. And then you ask yourself why it's 600 megabytes. We'll see that in the Power Query section, but custom visuals, fields, everything else, you shouldn't have a single column, object, measure, custom visual, page, anything in your model that is not used, unless it's like being rolled out in two weeks and it's just hidden or something. Because otherwise you just end up with a lot of cobwebs and a very messy room and you're the poor person who gets handed off to this when they come around. So with that said, the thing that I wanna focus on is the filters pane. So again, with this idea of a couple, couple of things that I want to talk about and hit on. So one, the filters pane, when we are from a reading reader perspective, this needs to be a curated experience. So right now, things are working pretty, pretty good. I have filters on this page, fields for my data model that makes sense to apply to the page that I'm on. And actually, I want to be here one more time. There we go. And we have filters on all pages, which is things that will apply to any of them. Now, both of these are scopes that make sense for the end users, but this is the issue that uh, gets missed or is not something that is tuned for the user experience. If I click on a visual, look what happens to all of the filters that the user should be interacting with. They get pushed down, far down the list, down to the bottom. So now we have all of these filters for this visual that are showing up, and I don't, I don't want my end user to like have to, A, figure out the pixel space to click off of it to get it back. 
So those pop-ups are, are a problem for the end user. We don't want those pop-ups. Now, I will also say that the, unfortunately today, the process that I'm gonna show you is painfully slow, but it is necessary if you are using the filters pane. Like really, really goes a long way to making sure that these pop-ups do not bug whoever is using it. And trust me, if they have to click on and off a of visual every time they wanna use the pane, it's a problem. It, it's They might not mention it, but it is still annoying to do. But you have to basically go to edit, got to select the visual, and you got to hide one of these at a time. Um, I'm working with another MVP to see if I can maybe create a script for Power BI PBI tools that Matthias Tierbach makes. I believe that I can edit a PBX file and auto hide all of them. I would love to make a, a uh, one click tool that instantly hides every single visual level filter for every visual in the whole report. That would be amazing. But today it is a, you got to go through and do it yourself. It's a manual process. There's no apply all. Um, there is a Power BI idea that I have that at the end of the, the session, um, Tina, if you could just remind me to bring that link up uh, once you go to the closing rounds. Um, I have a link to a Power BI ideas page that has about 140 votes, but my vote is to add a hide all button at the top of the visual level filters for any visual where you click it, everything below it hides. It's something that I think Microsoft really needs and I'm trying to get enough traction for them to be aware of it and hopefully push some uh, push that out. We will all but, vote for you. Yeah, it, it, it's stupidly painful and I hate it, but it's necessary. But now look, I click the visual. It, it doesn't break my filters pane. You know, that, that is something I have to do for other visuals too. Like you've got to go through and do this one at a time because of the nature of how you apply this, this should be the last thing that you do. Because if I if I was to do, um, let's let's see, I'm gonna let's just throw some random calculation in here. I'm just gonna add something else to the tooltip well. And this is the problem if you do this mid development. Come back to reading view. I have one single unhidden field in there. So the second that you add, remove, or replace any fields in that visual. That's not hidden by default. So make sure that this house has been completely built and that you're ready to like do the final polish because this is the very one of the very last things you should do. If you if you ever have like any iterative process where you're still getting feedback from the client, they're moving stuff around. No, no, no. Wait until they are 100% satisfied with every tooltip, every field, then do the hiding because guaranteed you'll you'll probably at one point swap something in a visual, forget to update the filter pane, and then you'll have that one out of 30 that's still showing up in this list. And you have to come back and where is it? Somewhere in here. Uh, there it is, right there in the middle. You have to hide it. So trust me, I've done this a thousand times um, and learned my lesson on that. So very last thing to do is hiding those. So curating the experience goes a long way for that. And it, it now we have helped to in, increase the adoption of the filter pane by hiding um, the visual of a filter. So that's kind of step one for this. <laughs> that's my cat. Uh, the other thing too, again, is in the filter pane, we wanna hide things that don't get used by the user. So I have a developer filter on the page, but it, I'll just say from the model, it makes sense this page needs this filter. The user could not see it or interact with it, but it is there. So those are the opportunities where that should be hidden. Data as a prior month, that's a special table that I have that lets you pick the end date of prior to current user configurable. Because with this unhidden right now, if they came to this visual, I'm just gonna pick the, the visual in the lower right. So we have three filters in there. Two of them can be configured by the end user. Data as a prior month, they can change that to current month. That changes the data. I would like them to see that because that is a filter they can add, remove, or modify. I have a slicer on the page that can be changed to the metric, so unique page use, changes the number on the visual, same thing. I would like to be aware of that change. It's telling the developer what, what they can configure themselves when they're looking at the report. That last one, metric you know, is not average session. They don't need to see that. That's a confusing label because it's irrelevant for them. It's not part of the scope of information that needs to be provided to them. So hidden gets, it rid, gets rid of that. And then when you actually go back to reading view, it's, it's uh, out of the, um, filters on this page section. There we go. So starts to clean up a little bit. And last little takeaway that I'll say here too is the um, be careful on as you're building out some of these things to again a little bit of house cleanup. Uh, if you have a column in your 
visual level, page level, or report level wells in your filters pane, and they get deleted from the model. They don't delete from your filters pane. You just get a little um, warning symbol to say that these columns no longer exist. I wish they would auto delete, or maybe you have an option to choose that yourself. It is a nice warning symbol if you're a developer to know that they maybe accidentally got deleted, but just be careful that you don't see these broken filters that show up. Um, and a big place that I actually see this kind of as a, uh, I call them like cobwebs, little, little bits of dust and, and stuff that accumulates as a report and a model changes over time. It's gone through 35 iterations, lots of changes have happened. The most common one that I see, see if I can find one here. I'm gonna go back to, here we go. Yes, so notice that as I'm looking through filters on this visual, so a lot of these, do not have an X icon. So like month over month page views, all these ones at the bottom with all of these tooltips in here, those are things that are in the visual. Every time I add something to any of these wells for the X axis, the Y axis, legend, small multiples, tooltips, they automatically get assigned something in the visual level filters because it's aligned to be able to add a filter to an element you're using in the query. Now, another big um, problem though, is when you are going through this and if you, added a field in here, like I have calendar month and year, this hierarchy used to have date. I got rid of that. Date is still in here as a level. So if you ever see something at the visual filter level with an X icon next to it, and does not have a filter applied to it, near guaranteed it's not needed. It's not something that anybody but you as a developer sees, but if you're trying to go through and kind of get an understanding of what's in here that matches what is in your report. Like these can be deleted. So they're small cobwebs, but uh, quite a few of these fields right here were fields that used to be in this visual that are no longer there. I see this commonly where if you take a visual, if you copy and paste it from one page to the other, and then you swap out a bunch of fields, you reconfigure it, a lot of that junk will kind of get left in your in your filters pane um, it, until you go clean it up. So um, it, it's not a uh, as necessary for the end users, but I do think as a developer, it uh, it goes a long way to prevent you from a long laundry list of uh, filters in here that are completely unused that aren't even part of the visual anymore. Yeah. Um, hey, Reed, quick question. You know, yeah. especially on this topic of laundry list, how Christine asks, do you have a process or do you have a recommendation for how to remember all these things? Like, do you have some level of checklist? Mm -hmm. um, you know, she's describing yes. they have a SharePoint list as their quote unquote checklist. Raymond mentions that they use a Word doc of things to remember to go through. Um, is there anything you use? I, wi I wish I had my own as well as as, as Kurt does, uh, Data Goblins. He ha he's built multiple checklists for everything. So awesome. he has a checklist for gateways, data flows, data sets, reports, dashboards, analyze, and Excel, deployment pipelines. Workspaces, apps. Uh, oh wow! Can you drop this link in the chat? I would love he, to throw this the, in our. He's probably the smartest person that I know when it comes to this stuff, and he he writes um, enviably good blogs uh, on this yeah, stuff. Like nobody so does good. this better. Yeah, and he just um, he just released a, a documentation that he uh, that he wrote for Ma Matthew and Melissa um, on uh, on some enterprise deployments. So my, like one of the new Microsoft Docs that just came out. Um, he like it was his first project where they asked him to to write that. Let's see if I actually have that. I love I love Kurt. But yeah, these are these are where I go for checklists. Uh, everything that I've talked about, Kurt has a lot of stuff related to this, but it's, it's so many so many good items. Um, let's see, do you drop it in? Here it is. Yes, enterprise content publishing. He just wrote this article. I, I want to go on a tangent because I, I love Kurt, but he just wrote this thing that came out about four days ago. Right, brand new article that that is uh, all focused on yeah, uh, enterprise content publishing for Power BI, and like he created the diagrams and everything and the whole checklist. But this is this is part of that whole implementation and adoption roadmap that um, Melissa Coates uh, created, and he wrote this specific piece for them. Super super smart dude. But yeah, these these checklists just coming back to that. Like if I go to reports things to look for, things to avoid. It actually does literally have like, I did this, I did this, I did this. So this is probably the best mirror to what I'm talking about. This is the checklist that you can go through. Like the, um, you know, is there default sort on visuals, testing and performance, user experience, disable visual headers, if no drill down or drill through needed, um, you know, en enable the modern visual tool tips, all sorts of stuff. And then little buttons that actually takes you to like, 
his favorite page that describes any of those things. So I love these checklists. It's really, really nice. Uh, he, he is just a mastermind on this stuff. And we're um, hopefully going to do a presentation together at, uh, at Data Mines um, coming up soon. If, uh, if we end up collaborating on that, but um, yeah, we, we have a few things in the works where we, we might collab on, on a few stuff. All right, um, back to this conversation in question. Yes, so I hit on the visual header, hiding the things at the, the visualization level, ensuring that the filter icon here is, sh is showing the correct information that we wanna see that's configurable by the user and getting rid of unused, unneeded, um, wells that are that are in there. Okay, I, I've hit on everything on the, the filters pane. So what I want to do now is kind of segue into some uh, some modeling stuff as well and, and talk a little bit about the, the desktop environment. So let me go ahead and here we go. Same file, but in Power BI desktop. And I think going back again to the idea of like quick things that I look for that I want to ensure um, still work and are still needed. So Similar to hiding some some unused fields at the visual filter level in the filters pane. Another thing that I do look for as well is to make sure that if there are bookmarks in the file, every one of them still gets used. I have had so many reports that I get that are a production report where there's like test one, test two, test three, lots of extra bookmarks um, that aren't even assigned to a button or are from an orphaned page. I'm actually in the process of trying to build an external tool that will detect if a bookmark is used anywhere. So one, was it built off of a page that doesn't exist? That's red flag number one. And two, is it assigned to a button? Um, technically, the end user can open up the bookmarks pane in Power BI and then use this to like use the bookmarks, but that's what most people don't build them for. They usually use some type of a bookmark button or something. But we want to ensure that like uh, this is grouped by page. That's usually how I organize my bookmarks. But visual switch, that doesn't do anything. It's from a page that doesn't exist anymore. So that's an example of, again, things to look for that was not cleaned up by the previous developer. That and this, if I wanted my quickest assessment of uh, curious, curiously to know the, the extra effort that a developer goes through is how many unnecessary bookmarks and how much organization was put into the selection pane in those two. Anytime I see these is pretty messy and unorganized, especially if there's a lot of test stuff that's probably not potentially not used anymore. I have a, there's a strong correlation of other things in the model that I'll find. There'll probably be tables with lots of unused um, columns and calculations, uh, measures that are unused, um, hidden broken measures that are in the model. But these are the kind of the canary in the coal mines that I start with from, from that top level before I start going backwards. Now, I did mention a, a tool that helps you clean up. Now, there's technically two external tools that can help you clean up your model. Because five years ago, if I wanted to know if a column was used in a report, the only way really to do that before tabulator and all that is you would right click a column, you delete it, and you would look at each report page. Did anything break? Nope. Okay, cool. Save the file. Let's try this again. 75 columns later. Uh, like that was the way to do cleanup. And that was slow enough that I would sometimes just go through and write down between each visual what each column in them was. I would do a you know d duplication d distinction on it, like probably in an Excel file, and then I would go to Power Query. I would use the choose column step, but I would select those, and it was a very painful process. Now we have two two things that can help to to identify immediately finding unused columns instantly in your report. My favorite still is um. M, uh, MK Feldman, a Power Query expert over from Germany. Uh, let me see if I can get the result file. So she has a PBIT file that can connect to your local model and it basically extracts the data out of the zip from the, the local PBIX file. So you do need the copy of the PBIX file on your computer. Um, and I will link you to her thing just in a second, but I want to show you what the completed report looks like. And as that's coming up, Power um, BI Cleaner. Okay. Yes, and it still works. And it has been updated in about a year, but I, as far as I know, it works in every report that I still use. Um, but the report, I got a pull, oh, there we go. This is what you're given. It scans, and then it will automatically tell you what to get rid of. So you can select can be deleted, delete. 
these are columns that aren't used anywhere. Uh, I, have, I have a fact table that is 100% deletable, uh, apparently. So I, there's an unused fact table. There are multiple columns in some of these uh, other tables here. And it also shows you their column size and cardinality. But she basically just extracts this metadata out of the, the report. And it's really useful to immediately like, oh, per table, delete, delete, delete. Super fast way to get rid of all this unnecessary information that might be in, um, in a report. Now, as we're looking at this, can anybody tell me what these local date table underscore 32A11, what do those represent? Gold star, if you actually know the feature that these are in Power BI. Greg, if you have a guess, it's a, it's a feature you could turn off for every report. It's kind of like a crutch for somebody who's never used Power BI if they want a year, quarter, and month column. Yep, exactly, auto date time. So uh, this is actually a great observation to show that they're not zero cost. Auto date time is they're, they're back end tables that are invisible to you. You only see them in the hierarchy, but they do exist and they're automatically created for every date data type column. So this is a great tool to actually show if your auto date time's turned on. You might end up with 20 or 30 of these if you have enough date columns. If you have four fact tables, each one has like four or five date columns, order date, delivery date, shipment date, um, purchase date, things like that, um, customer birthday, store open date, all of those will get a calendar table uh, created from them. But I love MK's tool. It's really useful um, to be able to see what, what can be deleted. It also shows you um, your DAX expressions and a few others. I could spend probably 20 minutes just on this. I just want to mention that this exists and let me give you her, probably helps if I give you the actual link in here. There we are. So awesome tool and really, really useful to instantly know what can I just gut from this model because so much unnecessary um, things are being added into there. But yes, auto date time, if I can open up one of my things in here, that's this. When you get that little date hierarchy, it's built into a report. If you have 30 minutes to make a report and you've never touched Power BI, this is useful. You import a fact table, it gives you year, quarter, month, day, but you can't edit. Uh, add, edit, or remove those columns. You can't rename them. They're just that is just the included date hierarchy. It is for Power BI beginners. They should not be used if you have your own dedicated calendar table. Another big thing that I look for in in a model, if if I ever see a report with this turned on, especially if they actually have a calendar table at the same time, I don't care what level you say your expertise is at. Like, but you're not intermediate to expert. You're you're back at the beginning level, or you just don't care enough to actually implement best practices. It's not something that should ever be used in a properly designed data model. And it's easy enough to turn off. It's just in the file option settings in here and two locations that it needs to be turned off at. Globally, I would hope that you have it turned off. Um, I think report settings. I know where it is in the file. I'm just trying to like, let's see. I thought. Oh, there it is right here. Yep, data load, auto date time for new files. Important, new files. So I can pop that over. Yeah, this turns it off for any net new, meaning if I click new, create a new PBX file, it won't have that. But historical files still have them. So auto date time, that is something that has to be turned off per each one. Because if you actually had to write a measure, um, so to da Davis, I'll get to your question in just a second. Um, there's another tool for that. <clears throat> So the auto date time turned off here. Uh, they don't turn it off for all files globally because a lot of measures can reference them. Quick measures use them. So a lot of things can break if you actually had a visual that used the native, uh, the built-in hierarchy. So they don't turn these off automatically just because you want to go one report at a time and check basically all this stuff. So my encouragement to you is to one, make sure to turn that off, um, but it will, uh, go a long way to cleaning up your report and getting rid of a lot of unnecessary complexity. Um, there's a couple of things I, I, I want to continue to talk about. Greg, how are we for time? Oh man, you got you should have ended five minutes ago. We got to wrap this up. I'm, I'm totally <laughs> kidding. I'm totally kidding. Um, it's 610. You know, I, yep. if you've got more content, you know, you've got an, a captive audience. So not here to okay. ruin the fun. Let's go, um, yeah, because I, I usually try to go for about an hour. And I think that'll be in about 10 minutes from now. I'll do about 10 more yeah. minutes. I'll wrap up with some conversations and then do some Q&A at the end. Um, we had a question in the chat about 
the BI cleaner, which will be the visuals. And um, let me double check. I, I don't think hers does. Um, ah, yeah, here we go. No, yes, yeah, it does actually. So if you click source measures and then you can click delete. Uh, there we are, not used at all. So these can be uh, deleted uh, from the model with, with those. So that's one nice thing that you can do is also use this to identify that. Now there's a newer tool because again, this is technically not going to get updated anymore. She has retired this product. It will it will continue to work until it doesn't. At some point, I'm sure Microsoft will do enough into the back end of their the things that um, that's if it's being used in a depend if it's being used in a chain if it's referenced by another measure I believe um, is, is where that's coming into play for not used at the end. Um, the other tool that's newer uh, is the Measure Killer by Gregor Bruner. Um, there's a free version which connects to one file at a time locally on your desktop, like MKS does. There's also an enterprise version where it will work with shared data sets. So if you have a data set with like 15 reports connected to it and you want to know then what's used and not, basically impossible. Like there's, at that point, you don't ever touch the, the production data set. And once it's in there, it never comes back out. That's kind of what the historical thing has been. But there is a um, tool that he's, he's built that... Uh, Again, has kind of two versions. There's either free or paid. Also the trial, but it does let you determine what measures are unused in a uh, in a golden data set that's that's shared among a bunch of reports. Uh, he just released that version of it earlier this year, but it's the first tool to ever do that, as far as I'm aware, in in, in Power BI. So, really, other cool tool. Um, he has a whole company around that. And let's see if I can let's keep using my guest browser. Major Killer Gregor Bruner. <laughs> I love that my website is the first thing that comes up for that. It's not even in his website. It's my website. That's really funny. I have not Googled this before. So it's apparently the search algorithms are prioritizing it. But that's that's kind of entertaining. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to get his link. He did do a, a, a stream on this. Um, I don't want to print teams. What is this? Pray? No, I wanna, there you go. All right. There is his actual website for this. and. And he, the, the link to the, the stream that he did with me, when was this? This was back in October, yeah. So great walkthrough, great. Nope, no, that's two links. There we go, <clears throat> under live stream. Uh, I, I've pretty much had every external tool that has um, out there. I try to feature all of them on my live streams um, just because I, I want people to be aware of those, but super cool tool. I'll let you go check that out, um, but fantastic thing that uh, has some enterprise features, especially when you're doing shared data sets. And uh, it deletes both unused measures and columns. So basically this is a better version of what MK's built. She even has on her blog, I think a, a mention. Aha, uh -huh. see, I'm retiring the support for this tool for now. So you can find an alternative, the measure, co measure killer by Bruner BI. So she even actually gives a shout out to him as like, this is the new better version that will be more scalable for large, for large clients. But these two tools are amazing. So I'll check both of those out. And again, like when you can one click, just check and audit things like that really, really useful. So I love that. I eventually want to see something like that come for the report that I can get a list of things that I can get rid of or fix. Um, I do think it is coming. Um, I just don't know when. So I'll give the you know, Microsoft answer for soon. Um, two things left that I want to talk about is a bit of house cleanup. Again, things to go through. We've talked about auto daytime hierarchies and deletions. Um, another thing that I think goes a long way to cleaning up a report is after you've verified what you need to keep. You have your tables and your columns left that you need. And at this point now, you need to organize what's left. All the cobwebs are gone. You, you know, you've, you've had your yard sale. You've gotten rid of the stuff you don't need. What can you do to clean and curate this up? So it's important to make sure to you know, hide things that aren't needed for the report layer. So tables like a last refresh table that maybe just has a single um, date that is going to be what is refreshed into a measure as a timestamp on the report page or anything that's you know back of house, those should be hidden. So your your key columns, uh, I have as a practice will say like your amount column should be hidden, your measure should be encouraged to be used, but um, hiding anything not necessary for your data. So if you look for date, 
I imagine a user is connecting to this as the shared data set. That's a confusing perspective. Even if I turned off auto date time, which I will, that's going to help, but it's still going to make this a lot less. Um, it, was, it still won't be perfect. So turn off auto date time. There we go. OK, less of them showing up in the fields list, but I still have a, an issue where if I look for date, wait, I have calendar date, fact table date, fact table other date. Like, which of these am I supposed to use in, in, a, in, a, in a line chart? So these are those things that I encourage you to do is to make sure that, like, put your hat on as the report reader. So when you're looking at this, are and, and like, search for the terms that they would search for. Like, if, if you have sales and forecasts, search for those words. What shows up in the filtered list if they're building out? If you have build permissions and are giving people options to do self-service BI in Excel, uh, with pivot tables and analyze in Excel, if they're using Power BI reports, do the same thing. Do they have options to be able to look through those? Um, and uh, are they given too many options? Are they using the right dimension versus fact tables? So plenty of opportunities to make sure that the right columns are hidden. So when they search for something, you're forcing them to use the fields that you want to in relation to the calculations that you do. So columns are important to hide. But on top of hiding, another really useful thing that you want to do is ensure that, like, one, have a measures table is nice to have. Um, I built that just by using the enter data button and just creating an empty table. As long as one or more measures are in any, any table in Power BI, and the only thing visible on the report layer is um, one or more DAX measures, you get the icon assigned like you see here, and it shows up at the top. But on top of that, I would hope that if you have calculations in here, you don't it, you don't have a list of like 500 calculations showing up. I built enterprise models with hundreds of calculations. That's not the problem. A well-organized model can be simple, even with hundreds of calculations and measures and columns, as long as you have the proper organization. So using display folders can help you achieve that. So like folder A versus you know, folder B. So top level. Easy. Okay, I open up my folder. What's the theme? What am I looking for? What's the um? What organization do I have? Okay, so I maybe I have my actuals, my time comparisons, um, my my for, my actuals minus forecast. Whatever groupings you want to assign to it in your folder names, that's up to you and your business logic. But when you have like folders in in your your computer, when you have things organized by folder and topic, it helps you to find the things that you need. And not only do you have an option for for folders at one level. You can also do subfolders as well. So if I do a, a backslash, it'd be like folder B, and I'll copy this into um, Word here just so you can, I want to zoom in so you can see the what I typed in a little bit. So what I'm typing is basically this right now, just to give you context. I did folder A and folder B. So the end result of that is that we have this extra little folder that's showing up. And I can do folder C. I can go as many folders deep as I want to. So any amount of folders and subfolders that I want to apply into here can be included as part of your business decisions and logic. Once the folder exists, you can drag and drop to put them in as well. So this folder B and I'll uh, put this in the folder F. There we go. So any levels that you want to have that allows them to open and explore downwards to get to their calculations. And then by the time they get there, they open up the folder. Folder A, all right, well, folder F. There's three calculations left, maybe 10 or 15, but I, I try to make any one of these folders that contains my, my measures no more than maybe 20 to 30 tops, usually 10 to 20, um, just because it, it becomes a little harder to find. Like we obviously have a search box, but if we're doing discovery by navigation, these go a long way to assist with that. Uh, the last thing that I'll mention here as a useful feature is you can also subfolder. So let me come back to the Word doc for just a sec. So if I actually did this and I added a semicolon in there, this puts that one measure in two folders. So let's try this. I'm going to uh, do folder F and subfolder F and subfolder B. Folder, folder, folder B. So I have a top level folder and then I am subfoldering between F and B for that. It's going to put it in both. Um, I think similar to why hierarchies can't be made in the report view, it's a little too easy. And also technically, the only way to create a new folder is in here. Um, but I, I think people don't want you to curate the data view outside of the model view. I, I, they're trying to encourage this to be the location to do all that stuff. 
But look that we have latest refresh date here and here between both of these. Oh, and actually I need to, it's technically at the root folder. So I also need to say folder A subfolder B. There we go. Okay. So two locations, folder C and folder F. So let's go ahead and to look for last. What was the one sec? Latest refresh date. Thank you. Two locations, folder B, folder F. If I drag this, it's still technically one file, one measure. It's uh, think of it like a shortcut. So if you have a calculation for actuals minus budget, do I put that in my folder for actuals? Do I put that in my folder for budget? I'm not sure, maybe both. So instead of ha having to figure out which to go or to have two measures, one in each, you, if you use that semicolon, this allows you to put it in any one of them. So I can do it at the top level. And I could also do it even at the lower level. So if I did this, that's technically going to put it inside of subfolder A and subfolder B inside of the top level folder for A. So any co possible combination of subfoldering and multifoldering can be done just from the model view in Power BI. So very useful way to do organization, but it goes, a, again, a long way, especially if you're trying to encourage shared data sets. And I see a lot of people with messy reports and messy models. and then you know you end up at that company with 100 reports and 100 data sets. Why? Because the only people who ever know how to use the data set is the person who built it, because they didn't do any effort to simplify it for other people who are not the builders of that. So build the report design, the data set design in a way that a person who is using it for the first time will understand what the fields are, what to use in the visuals. And a lot of this goes a really long way to ensure adoption of that. Um, if local measures can be created, um, so can local folders. Uh, I'm not sure I follow on that one because I mean, like this is an imported model, so these are all local. But I think you just mean in a in a live data set, if you can create report level measures, you would want to be able to create report level folders. Yeah, I thought you could. Yeah, exactly. That's that's what I was thinking, right? The, um, <clears throat> if you're in a live Let's data set, right? Um, you can create local measures. But then, I, I mean, the folder, the folder organization is like the visual organization, right? So if you are, you know, that's like the most natural place where you want to organize the measures because that's where you kind of see them in the report as well. But um, yeah, it's unfortunate you have to like go to another view. Uh, yeah, OK, that's out. But if I did a composite model, I probably could. It's a good question. Like I haven't thought of like against live data set, so I think essentially I would have to you know, connect. Yeah, I'm wondering if I can move them. I I am curious now. Composite model. Let's just call this DAGs V2. Load. Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Doing it live. Okay, DAGs V2. So, <laughs> can I? Does this actually work? I think I just might have figured out like a little. All right. So, if I just do this uh, folder A, okay. And the original one, folder B. So, I, I technically created a composite model, but if I just get rid of that like new table that I built, I don't even need it anymore. It's still a composite model. Okay. Yeah. That still works. So I mean, like you could technically create a composite model with nothing new added. You just turn on composite model mixed mode. You can start foldering your measures that were that were built in the live data set to however you want to use it. You're technically so, not adding any new data. So Reed, what I was saying, if you go to the the uh, report view, can you create can you create out a folder in the report view? That's what I was referring to. So in any version of Power BI Desktop, no, they they just don't want data view edits outside of hiding to be edited here. Um, but the, yeah, so like it, it's just that, yeah, that's not an option in any version of, of, of Power BI. It, it's just something that can only be done from this view in, in any import live or composite. But that's what I was saying. Like you can create a measure out of that report view, right? You go to the ribbon and you create a measure, yeah. but not a folder where that measure can actually be stored, you know, like attributed to. Yeah. Yep, yep, yeah, it, it, exactly. Like it, it, it's advanced properties can only be accessed from um, 
you know, yeah. th this section for, for, for a degree. Like same with descriptions. You can't change the description outside of this view as well. Um, I think there's hopefully some changes maybe coming around that, but the full scope of every element that can be changed um, usually is just done from here. Okay, thank you. Yep, no problem. Okay. What I'll do, just given it's about 626 now, um, I mean, I can go on for like an hour, but I want to give opportunity for people to ask some Q&A questions and other stuff. So uh, I tend to add a separate report measure table so folks know where to put them. Yeah, <clears throat> and that's one thing you can do as well as you can either give them the placeholder, uh, Brian, or you can you know, use the compo composite model scenario and just pop one into there. Uh, that way you're not mixing them in. Um, or if you were to add a, a new one to this, a new measure, and then you can just add a folder specifically to that. So it's you know, one, and then, but I do like your mention of just calling out report level measures. Let's say report level DAX, that's shorter. There we go. All sorts of ways to arrive at home, but organization definitely is key when it comes to just cleaning up this stuff. But I actually, like, I did discover this new. I didn't really think about like, what about if the person who actually created the shared data set, if I want to organize it differently than them, um, creating a composite model without actually adding anything new from a new data source gives you autonomy to actually reconfigure this now for yourself. So that is kind of nice as a, I guess an interesting use case to use composite modeling for. So I'll uh, you know take that as you will. But um, yeah, I'd never actually tried that before. So that was a fun little uh, thing that I just learned. Uh, question, do you think Data Mart is a dead feature? Um, I mean, it hasn't started yet. So it's still a new thing. Um, it's not grown up yet. I'd still, it's, um, it's a bicycle with training wheels. So I think that uh, until it has the ability to write you know, if you can connect with it with SSMS, but only in read mode, like I want, I want to be able to run stored procedures against it. I want to run SQL scripts against it. I want to do a lot of other stuff and not just have to use Power BI for that. So um, I think there, there's, there's plenty of room for it to grow and evolve. Um, so I don't think it's dead. I just don't think it's gotten a time to shine. And I don't use it yet because data, data flows do pretty much everything for, that I need for that. If they need something more robust than that, they're usually just going back to Azure. So right. um, I, I, I'm hoping to see what I, what what comes around it. And um, all, all I'll say is just the, um, <clears throat> I think uh, there's going to be good changes this year on just better enterprise um, the options for, for clients. And Microsoft has been teasing on like a lot of cool stuff coming out for, uh, for build. So just keep your eyes on build. You have about four weeks until that. Some really cool stuff will be coming out um, in general, just, yeah, uh, for yeah. for the for the Power BI space. I was just going to mention it just hasn't gained any traction with uh, most of our clients, and uh, and they tried really hard. <laughs> yeah, I mean it, it's it's not quite there yet. Like I assume most people who use it immediately want X, Y, or Z, and it doesn't really have those. Like it, there's some cool stuff uh, about it. Like you know, they, they even today you can run. Um, uh, you know, you can have the automatic model created on top of it, all this other stuff, but they, they released it too early. It was like kind of a half-baked feature, and I'm I'm thinking and hoping in the next 12 to 24 months, they'll have a lot more to it, but it's it's not complete. It, you know, it's a half-baked item at the, at the moment. And I, I don't um, think and, you know, like, it, you know, at a departmental level, like where you're really fighting against your IT, you know, um, uh, fences or something, right? You could create something to to gain yourself traction with some like a built-in automatic database, but at enterprise level scale is just doesn't seem like a robust enough feature, like you said. Exactly. I mean, it, it's trying to go after like the you know it's baby's first data uh, database, and it's you know for the SMB people who are like, hey, maybe previously all of their data was kept in Excel files on SharePoint. You can still make the argument for data flows, but it, it's it's a it's a larger version of a data flow that's more relational, um, really is it, what its goal is for. But um, I do hope for for you know a greater ability to be able to house data inside of Power BI and just and for data flow, uh, data march to get more features like that. So like that that would be my my hope is I have a lot of my SMB clients who just you know they're scared of Azure and it's it seems expensive or too complicated. Like you know I just want to be able to do more things in data as far as the data prep process in Power BI, but. We still have at least flows today, and that's I always roll back to those. Just just uh, good quality data flows with like direct query if you have premium. Uh, I do want to get to some other questions. So let's see. We have um, Ty. Uh, do you have any resources in learning fancy in Power Query? Um, some of my my favorites uh, is if I can get up here. 
Skill Wave, which is Matt Ellington, um, Miguel Escobar, and Ken Pulse. Two of the smartest people, I think, when it comes to Power Query are Ken Pulse. He does excel in Power Query stuff. They wrote the M is for Data Monkey book. Uh, both of these are really, really great stuff. And they have they have lots of training on the Power Query. So um, super useful. Um, a little biased. I do actually like one of my one of the only courses that I still have online is actually up here somewhere. Um, there it is. He designed it in advanced reports. I'm, I'm, I have one of my trainings hosted here, but they have lots of cool trainings. Um, Matt Ellington does the DAX one, super useful. Uh, you know, shout out to Brian, of course, as well. I love his his, uh, his fundamentals of DAX course, which is a, a pretty good one too. He has a lot of visuals that he likes to use to explain how the functions and features works, which is great. But uh, Matt Ellington's up there as well. He's really good at explaining complex simply. And I think that's important for people who are just getting started with any tool. So this is a great platform for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're uh, like, I think you, you, you do similarly, you do the job well. Um, and uh, I've liked the files that you've had where you like change the cell and all these other things changed. It kind of helps to show the the pipes. It's been a couple of years since I've seen it, but I remember very specifically you had a multiple pages where you change a value and it's all it would cascade to all these different parts and like it kind of helped to show you how the pipeline worked uh, for for DAX. I'm like, oh, that's a great learning tool. It's really useful for people who don't really understand how you got from A to F because it's all happening behind the curtain. And it only took that's... about six minutes, uh, about an hour to develop like two minutes worth of content. So it was great. <laughs> Yeah, there's definitely <laughs> those times where like I'm a visual learner, but like, oh man, I gotta build a Rube Goldberg machine because I, I know in my head how it's supposed to be, but actually making it happen bespoke is yeah, it takes a lot of time sometimes. Hey, do you like that five minute demo? Cool, that took me four hours. Did we have <laughs> yep. three hours of training left? Yep. <laughs> yeah, yep. Uh let's see. Have I experimented with Tim Dole yet? Um let's see. I wanna. It's a great plug for if, if anybody's interested in a shirt. Um, I have a store that has these. I sell almost none of them, but I have them in sold to YouTube. See it. We're all about the swag. I just have a new. I just created a new one with Timble, uh, Timble, and the and I'll just say that. So, store. one of the most recent ones I saw was um, Chris Wagner's is. Star Schema. There we go. <laughs> Tim Dill, yeah. uh-huh, yeah. The Drake, Drake meme. Uh, and I had I had the an artist uh, render my avatar like that. And uh, you, you can get a shirt in a few different colors, um, you know, and, and order that, you know. But uh, I, I'm very much into Tim Dill. I love it. I want to see, um, I want to see our deal. I want to, I want to see a report defin definition language next. So please, I hope Microsoft approaches the report.layout file with the same love that they have done the model. Um, dot schema uh, JSON file, but Tim is amazing. It is for anybody doing Git, multi-author environments, or any kind of advanced modeling report. It's so nice to just the formatting and everything is beautiful. So um, absolutely uh, love it. That's why I have a T-shirt. So feel free to um, get a shirt if you if you want to rock some swag. I got a few others. I got some stickers as well. Um, I also will say from here, I just had him on my stream. Where are you, Matthias? Down, down. There it is. He was just on my stream about a week right after he announced it. So there we go. Also the stream that Matthias did. Um, plenty of stuff on my YouTube channel, as you can see. A lot, lots of cool streams that I've done with people. Um, but uh, yeah, Timble's fantastic. Uh, keep your eyes out, um, especially to build and other cool announcements related to that as well. But it is the start of many things to come for a pro developer feature for Power BI. Awesome. Uh, Reed, last yeah, reminder, yeah. Uh, the yeah. hide all voting page. Yes, 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 yes. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I have to go quickly scrub my LinkedIn. So if there's any other questions, um, I'll let, I'll answer those. If not, I can hand it to you to do some closing remarks and I'll pull that up in the back end and then paste it into the chat. Excellent. See you guys soon. Thank you so Thank much. You Enjoy the summer.